Dear colleagues and friends of the Wilkelin Colloquium, on behalf of Baylor University, I'm very happy to welcome you here to Baylor. Uh, my uh, friend and, and our Dean, Thomas Hibbs, is uh, a wee bit under the weather, as we would say, where I come from, uh, which means he's just sick as a dog and he can't be here tonight. So uh, I'm standing in for him. I just want to say that uh, we are so pleased to have been involved with the Wilkelin Colloquium over these last several years. This is the seventh. Uh, session that we have had together. It has produced some of the most interesting and fruitful theological conversations that we've had here at ba Baylor University during that time. And uh, some of you have been uh, patient and perseverant participants in this conversation through the whole. And so we thank each of you for that. To begin our deliber deliberations together tonight, we have uh, uh, a, a wonderful speaker, and I'm not going to introduce him, somebody else is going to do that, but I'm going to call uh, upon first Matthew Levering to speak on behalf of the colloquium to you all. Where is Matthew Levering? There he is. There he is. Uh, thanks everyone for coming, and, and my job is not, not yet to introduce Peter. That, that's going to be, I'm introducing the guy who's introducing Peter. But my job really is, uh, um, on, on behalf of Hans Wurz, my co-organizer, co and Chad, Chad Wraith, um, my job is to um, thank all the people who have made this possible. I really want to thank um, the Baylor faculty um, and, of course, Tom Hibbs um, for really um, the financial support for all these years. Um, I definitely got to thank Paulette. Um, is Paulette still? She's here. Right here. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, I'm not very well organized, and Paulette's always been so patient and incredibly well organized, and I just feel so grateful to Paulette and to Tom and all the Baylor faculty here and, and then the people who um, have come to the, to the lectures. Also, also, it's been a wonderful chance to, um, you know, wonderful years of, of dialogue, evangelical Catholic uh, reflection together, and wonderful friendships, and um, especially, of course, with um, that's just the opportunity to, to do something with Hans Borsma and to share our common love for the Church Fathers and just for, for theology in general. So I feel very grateful and very appreciative of all the, all the um, as I always say, I'm, I'm very good at losing other people's money and just feel extremely grateful to have lost so much of other people's money doing this project. So um, let me now um, introduce uh, my friend, student, former student, um, Charles Ray, Chad. Uh, welcome to the Wilkin Colloquium. Um, I'm Chad Wraith. I direct the Paradosis Center for Theology and Scripture and a, so, assistant professor of uh, religion and philosophy at John Brown University, which is in Northwest Arkansas, uh, the best part of Arkansas, we say. Um, so this is our final Wilkin Colloquium. Uh, that we'll be having. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been uh, just an amazing experience. A lot of great people and great minds have come together thanks to this colloquium. Um, and we are uh, honored that we could honor uh, Robert Wilkin um, with uh, such a colloquium, and we hope uh, he has been uh, proud of us uh, and what we've tried to accomplish through the years. Um, so it's been a real joy. Uh, in some ways, the colloquium will be continuing on in a different kind of fashion. This is what we try to do with the Paradosis Center Conference. If you're a, a guest here and you have a pamphlet, the conference is uh, in your little folder, but there's some downstairs too. So we hold a biennial conference. That's a word I had to learn every other year conference at John Brown University uh, that brings together Catholics and Orthodox and Evangelicals. Um, so you can look at that later at some other time. It's tends to be a very fruitful uh, time together as well. So on with the show um, for tonight. So I'm here going to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Lightheart, someone we all know and respect and are very thrilled about being here tonight. Um, he holds a PhD from Cambridge uh, and is president of the Theopolis Institute and an adjunct senior fellow of theology at New St. Andrews College in Moscow, Idaho. He is ordained in the communion of the Reformed Evangelical Churches. He has served in two pastorates. He was pastor of Reformed Heritage Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama from 1989 to 1995, and was pastor of Trinity Reformed Church in Moscow, Idaho from 2003 to 2013. 
From 1998 and 2013, he taught theology and literature full-time at New St. Andrews College in Moscow, Idaho. He is the author of many, many books, uh, and most recently, uh, Gratitude and Intellectual History from Baylor University in 2004, as well as Traces of the Trinity from Brazos, 2015. Dr. Lightheart also writes a blog as well as a regular bi-weekly column at firstthings.com. He has published articles in many periodicals, both popular and academic, and Dr. Lightheart and his wonderful wife, Noel, have 10 children and seven grandchildren. So please, let's warmly welcome Dr. Lightheart. Thank you very much. I take full responsibility for the late start. I was back at the hotel leisurely waiting for the 7 o'clock shuttle, uh, which I caught, but that turned out to be the wrong shuttle. It was supposed to be there at 6.30 instead of 7, so I apologize for that. I apologize for any uh, extra beats of the heart that I caused the organizers of the event. Um, I also want to echo my appreciation for the Wilkin Colloquium. I've participated in a number of these over the last uh, five or six years. It's been an edifying uh, time, a great blessing. I know that one of the intentions that uh, Hans and Matt had at the beginning uh, was to foster friendship among Catholic and evangelical scholars. And I think that, uh, that goal, I don't know if you think your other goals have been accomplished, but I feel that that goal has been accomplished uh, quite well. It's uh, a great privilege uh, and it's been a great blessing for me to get to know uh, the regular members of the Wilkin Colloquium and to form what I expect to be continuing friendships with them. Um, it's a great and intimidating privilege to be giving this lecture at the beginning of the last of the Wilkin Colloquia. That's intimidating because of the roster of speakers that we have and others who are here this weekend, or this week, this weekend. Uh, and um, I'm very blessed and very honored to be speaking to you. My topic is gospel as atonement, theology, as atonement theory, the Jesus of history, and the Christ of the cross. In a characteristically pithy essay, Robert Jensen has decried the two paired errors of traditional atonement theory. On the one hand, the cross is separated from its future in the resurrection, and on the other, from its past in the can canonical history of Israel. For the apostles, crucifixion is anything but beneficial without resurrection. Whereas for Anselm, God and humanity are reconciled when Jesus dies and the resurrection tidies up. That's um, Will, uh, Jer, uh, Jensen's phrase. Uh, ignoring Israel's history leaves the impression that the creator could just as well have sent his son to reunite humanity with himself without having done, he, done any of the works described in the Old Testament after the first chapter of Genesis. Abraham and Exodus, exile and return have retained some role in the preaching and liturgical celebration of the cross but Jensen argues many powerful systems of theology make no use of the Old Testament except as witness to creation and sin and as religious background for Jesus. To those complaints, I want to add a third and focus on it, which Jensen mentions but doesn't develop. Jesus' death is often isolated in atonement theory from the life that precedes it. As with Jensen, my complaint is not about theologians who deny that Jesus lived the life depicted in the Gospels. They, ha they have their reward. My complaint is against theologians for whom Jesus' career has a minimal role in explaining how he achieves salvation. Michael Root has argued that the soteriological task is always creation of a new version of the story, narrative redescription or augmentation. But the question is always, what story is being redescribed and augmented? We can put my question this way. Do atonement theories work if Jesus had not been a prophet an itinerant rabbi, healer, and exorcist who collected and commissioned disciples, who disputed with and enraged scribes and Pharisees in Galilee and Jerusalem, who ate and drank with sinners and befriended outcasts? Would the gears of atonement theory mesh smoothly if Jesus had remained a sinless carpenter in Nazareth until his eventual death? For some classic theories, the answer to these questions seems to be yes. Anselm makes passing reference to the works so many and so great that Jesus performs, which testify to his majesty. He describes Jesus as a teacher who taught sinners how to live by word and example. 
But these references to the life of Jesus provide proof of the fittingness of the incarnation more than they are integral to his understanding of the cross. For Anselm, Jesus must live a life of free obedience in order to present the Father the infinite gift that exceeds every debt, in David Hart's lovely phrase. But the specific shape of that life never comes into focus. Calvin thinks that the Apostles' Creed is, re is right to move from Jesus' birth to his death and resurrection because scripture ascribes salvation as peculiar and proper to Christ's death. Calvin does insist that the cross is useless apart from the life of obedience. Christ abolished sin, banished the separation between us and God, and acquired righteousness to render God favorable and kindly toward us through the whole course of his obedience. Citing Romans 5, Calvin says that Jesus obeys to pay the price of liberation in order to redeem us. By obedience, Calvin appears to mean conformity to the moral law of God, but that raises my question again. Could Jesus have been an obedient plumber and accomplished the same thing? One expects Calvin's discussion of the threefold office to help answer that kind of question, but Calvin's treatment of prophet, priest, and king in the institutes, at least, is largely tropological. Jesus' prophetic office, for instance, is important because he shares his anointing with the whole of his body so that the power of the Spirit might be present in the continuing preaching of the gospel. Jesus' life as a prophet is not clearly linked to his death. Thomas fares better. Thomas analyzes the passion and death of Jesus after a long series of questions about episodes from his life. He recognizes that Christ's works are themselves saving, since he delivers the demon-possessed and works miracles for the good of man and principally for the salvation of his soul. Yet many of Thomas' observations of the life of Jesus tend toward the tropological. Jesus was tempted to strengthen us against temptations and to give us an example of how to overcome the devil. Or the de events of Jesus' life prove his divinity. Miracles confirm his teaching and make God's presence manifest, thus providing a su sufficient proof of his Godhead. When Thomas turns to the passion itself, he remains a theological commentator, asking how the suitability of the specific time and place of Jesus' death, the fittingness of his death between thieves, as well as questions like the depth of his suffering. Some of Thomas's answers are little more than edifying typologies, but the attentiveness to the specifics of the crucifixion strikingly contrasts to the more abstracted treatment of Anselm. When he addresses theoretical questions, questions about the necessity, effect, and mechanics of the atonement, Thomas does not lose track of the evangelical history. Does Jesus slay himself, or was he slain by others, he asks in the first article of question 47. And Thomas answers, by distinguishing between direct, uh, Thomas answers by dis, uh, distinguishing between direct and indirect causation, concluding that Christ's persecutors slew him because they inflicted on him what was a sufficient cause of death. And yet Jesus also laid down his own life because he didn't prevent them from killing him, which he had the power to do. Though Thomas fares better by attending to the specifics of Jesus' death, uh, life and his death, the details tend to be isolated and don't form really a coherent theory uh, of atonement. To use language that is probably anachronistic for most of these writers, Jesus' life is treated under the rubric of Christology, the cross in the locus of soteriology. In a modern theology, the situation is worse. As theologians leave the text recording the history of Israel and the life of Jesus to historic critics and have to make do with whatever scraps of history and tradition are left as residue. To clarify before moving on, I'm not attacking atonement theory. To be sure, the church survived and flourished for many centuries on a steady diet of the kind of atonement theology that Anselm described as pictorial representation, which Anselm thought unbelievers would regard as nothing more than painting on a cloud. Schleiermacher seems to have been the first to introduce the phrase atonement theory, and Harnack was among the first to describe different models of the atonement. Yet long before the 19th century and far from German universities, theologians felt a need to explain the divine rationale of the cross. Atonement theory might be dismissed as an effort to subject the saving work of Christ to theoretical reason, to rationalize the mystery. But it's hard to fault the, uh, the project. Our message of human and cosmic salvation is so strange, so unexpected, that it demands explanation. It's very folly, not to mention the challenges of cultured Hellenists and post-Kantians, force us to ask why God chose to do as he did. A theory is needed not mainly, as Harnack thought, to explain the necessity of the cross. It's needed to explain the how, the mechanism of the atonement. And that's needed to show how the cross can be a plausible 
or convincing account of, of how God deals with what Paul Griffiths hauntingly describes as the devastation. Atonement theory seeks to explain how the blatant injustice of Jesus' death can be a divine act of salvation. Yet, as Jensen says, after they disembed the cross from the history of Israel and the history of Jesus, even the best theologians are compelled to find some other framework that can make sense of the cross. All atonement theories have to harmonize divine and human intentions, but those other frameworks inevitably skim lightly over the psycho-historical dynamics of the dramatis personae in order to tease out a narrative logic that may work at a different level altogether. And I'm thinking, for example, of Anselm's concern uh, for filling in the missing angels. Uh, Jesus has to provide atonement so that the fallen angels are replaced. If I may channel Jensen for one more moment, uh, if Israel's history identifies the living God, then atonement theory that ignores that history does not quite know which God is at work in the cross. Theologians wheel out what Jensen calls unbaptized theology, which are ill-fitting clothing for a crucified God. And finally, detached from Israel and from the life of Jesus, atonement theory cannot make good on de Lubeck's claim, which given my time limitations, I must simply assert, his claim that Judaism passed on to Christianity its concept of salvation as essentially social. A successful atonement theory must explain how the church is the telos of Jesus' work, must also recognize that the church is on the stage during the accomplishment of the atonement. Now these are wide-ranging uh, wide observations and criticisms. I have about a half hour to go and I want to be cheerily positive for the rest of my time. So in what follows, I briefly developed two large points with a couple of subpoints under the second. First, I want to narrate the history of Israel and Jesus briefly in a way that explains how Jesus' mission is obedient to Torah and also takes account of the political circumstances of Jesus' life and the potential or plausible intentions of his human opponents. Second, I'll examine features of atonement theory from within that framework of the, of the story of Jesus to show that they are coherent uh, within the, fr the narrative framework of the canonical history of, uh, Jesus, uh, of Israel and the Gospels, and I think more coherent than in other frameworks. What results is not a theory, even a sketch of a theory. I don't have time to really develop that, but I trust that I'll be able to hint at a soteriology that explains how the Jesus of history is the Christ of the cross, and hope will at least suggest that the gospel is adequate to serve as a framework for atonement theory. So first, I want to talk about the Old Covenant and Torah, but before we can speak of Torah, we must speak of Eden. Born naked as an infant, Adam was under guardians and managers until the time set by his father. Created to be the Lord of all, to share in the Creator's rule over creation, Adam would one day be elevated to kingship. At the moment of his birth from earth and God's breath, he was a trainee, a servant in the Lord's garden. Adam could eat the fruit of the tree of life, communing in life with his father. But for the time being, he was not permitted to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of judgment that signifies his eventual entrance, signified his eventual entrance into mature kingly wisdom and authority. Taste not, touch not was the first lesson of humanity's pedagogy. The most immediate and explicit consequence of Adam's disobedience was his exclu exclusion from the Garden of Eden and specifically from the Tree of Life. And that exclusion is the premise of the entire Old Covenant order. Outside Eden, Adam and his children were not only weak and dependent creatures, but were now delivered over to the reign of death and sin, living in corruptible, shameful, and now mortal flesh. By Adam's sin, the whole human race came under wrath, under God's handing over of humanity to the enslavement they chose for themselves. Cain didn't eat the forbidden fruit, but he too was exiled from Eden. According to Paul, death came into the world on the heels of sin, so that after Adam, death spread to all men, and where death spread, sin spread. From the beginning, the garden was a unique location. It was Yahweh's earthly home, where Adam and Eve were to commune with him through the fruit of the tree of life. It was holy space because the holy God was present there. After Adam's expulsion from the garden, holy space became inaccessible space. Yahweh stationed cherubim at the gate of the garden to guard against every attempt at re-entry. From Adam on to enter the presence of God, one had to pass through the cherubic sword and fire. No man could commune in the presence of God unless he first died. Babel added another complexity. After Babel, the human race became internally divided as well as separated from God's sanctuary. In the aftermath of Babel, Yahweh called Abraham as a new Adam, the father of a new humanity, 
Through Abraham and his seed, God promised to restore the human race to himself and to knit the human race back together. Torah fits into this context as a step toward the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. Torah is given to Israel outside of Eden, after Babel, and it assumes the conditions of Edenic and Babelic curse. Torah doesn't restore open access to the garden. It doesn't demand that the cherub, cherubim lay down their fiery swords. It doesn't reunite the nations or make them one flesh with God. Simply by, give, uh, by the fact that it's, give, it's given to Israel and not to everyone, Torah establishes a hierarchy of access and responsibility. Torah is co- accommodated, in other words, to the post-lapsarian conditions of the human race. Yet Torah institutes a partial recovery of Eden. The construction of a sanctuary creates a distinction between holy and common space, thereby between holy and common people and things, but the intention behind the sanctuary is frequently misunderstood. Israel's holy places are restricted places, off limits to any but authorized personnel. But the building of the tabernacle and later the temple does not create the conditions of exclusion and distance. Rather, the sanctuary represents a counter movement to the curse of Eden. After Eden, the Creator had no earthly home. At Sinai, he moved into a tent among the tents of Israel. Yahweh drove Adam and Eve out of the garden. He invites Aaron and his sons in. For the first time since Eden, a human being stands before the Creator to serve. For the first time since Yahweh stationed cherubim at the gate of the garden, human beings, priests, take over the Adamic cherubic task of guarding Yahweh's house. For the first time since Adam, holy men walk on holy ground with a veil embroidered with cherubim between them and their creator. The tabernacle is holy space, but the boundaries of holy space under Torah have become porous. Having taken up residence among the Israelites, Yahweh invites all of them to his house to share his goods. Under the circumstances, Yahweh's hospitality must be restricted. The welcome must be a controlled welcome. But Yahweh sets up his house so Israel can draw as near as possible. And the various regulations of Torah have to be understood in this context. Purity regulations are frequently explained as expressions of disgust, as distance marking boundaries. Whatever, else they, whatever they are elsewhere though, in Leviticus they're the opposite. Yahweh specifies the physical conditions that make Israelites unacceptable in his presence, but then he invites them in by publishing the rituals by which they can become clean and approach in safety. The purity regulations of Torah are prohibitions, taste not, touch not, but the prohibitions are imposed for the sake of limited access. The no to impurity is for the sake, uh, is for the sake of the yes of welcome. The purity texts do focus on the details of impurity, but the telos of these regulations is to prescribe mechanisms for the removal of impurity, which means the closure of distance and the return of humanity to God. Sacrifice is to be understood in the same way. Sacrifice is a gate liturgy, a liturgy of return designed for worshipers who are already excluded from full and complete enjoyment of the presence of God. Sacrifice doesn't eliminate that distance, but it does what can be done. Like Yahweh's original sacrifice outside Eden, the sacrifices of the sanctuary cover Israel. The worshiper himself can't draw near to Yahweh's table to offer himself as bread for God but he sends a substitutionary animal to represent him in Yahweh's presence to submit to the sword and to be translated to divine smoke and fire on his behalf. The animal can't get into God's presence without suffering death at the hands of the cherubic priests with their sword and fire. Yet through the animal's death and his transfiguration in smoke, the worshiper is able to draw near to the creator. Augustine's definition of sacrifice from City of God 10.6 is that any, it's any act by which the actors seek to be united to God in holy society. And that captures the essence, the sense of Levitical sacrifice. Sacrifice traverses the boundary between profane and sacred space as the animal serves in a priestly capacity to enter the sanctuary on the worshiper's behalf. It includes a moment of substitutionary death, but the animal dies in the process of drawing near to God. Yahweh expelled Adam from the garden in wrath, but in the tabernacle, he goes out into the howling waste to find his unfaithful bride and to bring her home. He goes outside Eden to give a taste of Eden to Adam's children who live east of Eden. Torah is part of Yahweh's mission as the good shepherd who seeks and restores the lost. And of course, in that very specific sense, Jesus comes to fulfill Torah. Jesus, as Calvin says, is obedient to the detailed regulations of the law. He doesn't break his father's commandments. 
But more deeply, he faithfully enacts the mission of Torah in order to undo the curses of Eden and Babel. Announcing the coming of God's kingdom, Jesus enacts all the Torah aimed at and partially achieved. In Jesus, Yahweh steps out from behind the temple curtains into Israel's flesh, offering welcome, festivity, hospitality, forgiveness, joy, and abundant life. To draw near to Jesus is to draw near to the temple. Anyone who eats with Jesus is closer to Yahweh than any priest had ever been. Jesus purifies the unclean, not with purity rites, but by the finger of God, the touch of the king that communicates the sanctifying power of the spirit. Wherever Jesus goes, Eden is realized again, an Eden of open access and abundance. Jesus even welcomes Gentiles, heals and eats with them too, undoing Babel. Jesus teaches a way of justice, a righteousness that surpasses the scribes, and around him forms a community of followers, living by the Torah of Jesus. Jesus calls 12 disciples, confers apostolic authority on them to make them partners in his mission and leaders of the renewed Israel that he assembles. That band of disciples following, eating, and conversing with the incarnate creator is the seed form of the church. It's the first barely visible beginning of salvation in social form. From the beginning, both John the Baptist and Jesus announced that Israel is doomed. Jesus tells parables that depict the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders as murderous villains, so angering his targets that they plot to murder him. He rides into Jerusalem as the king of Zechariah 9, condemns the temple as a den of thieves while pre-enacting its eventual destruction, excoriates the scribes and Pharisees as prophet-murdering hypocrites, uh, shames Jewish intellectuals in public dispute, and prophesies that the temple will be dismantled block by massive block. Everything he speaks and does fulfills Torah, and Jesus knows that his mission puts him on a collision course with the Jewish leaders, and it does. Jesus spends most of his public ministry teaching and executing a new way, but the rulers and authorities of this world don't let him get away with it. Jesus is crucified as a rebel against Torah because he claims authority to purify and heal because of his lordly act in the temple because he acts as if he were himself the locus of God's presence. The Jewish leaders want Jesus dead because he threatens the system that they consider the unchasing physics of religion and society. Romans want Jesus dead to protect the peace and calm of a bit of the Eastern Empire, to vindicate Roman honor and power. Torah and Roman justice are both commandeered into a supreme act of injustice, killing the one who enacted the justice that Torah and Roman law had always aimed to achieve. Jesus lives by the spirit in the midst of the flesh, and the guardians of Torah and Romanitas cannot tolerate the transgression of the spirit who blows where he wills. They crucify Jesus, a son sacrificed to the interests of slaves, a man slaughtered by children content to remain in their childhood. So why did Jesus die? On the account just offered, he died because he provoked the murderous rage of those who had the authority to kill him. That's a psycho-historical answer to the question, but it's also a theological answer because the Jesus who provoked the murderous rage of Jewish and Roman leaders was the incarnate son of God, the incarnate son of the God of Israel, the creator God who expelled Adam from Eden, offered promises to Abraham, appeared on Sinai to deliver the law. That God comes to take his throne, but those he comes to rule don't want him as their ruler and judge. God comes to his own and his own do not receive him. Yet, of course, God is not finished. The rage of Jew and Gentile does not prevent him from keeping his promises to Adam and Abraham. Death itself does not prevent him from opening Eden and forming one new humanity from the post babelic shards. And in fact, his death is part of the opening of Eden. In his resurrection, in the resurrection of Jesus, the Father overturns the verdicts against Jesus, proves Jesus to be the beloved Son, and raises him to continue his mission, now on the far side of death. Jesus regathers his disciples and sends his spirit to them. Filled with the spirit of Jesus, reconciled to their father, they continue to live as they lived with Jesus, eating, drinking, rejoicing, preaching the kingdom, casting out demons, providing for the needy. They invite others to share in this new humanity, the society of salvation. That's the framework within which I want to explore a couple of details of atonement theory. As noted earlier, the purpose of this exploration is partly apologetic. If our claim that God saves through the cross of Jesus makes no rational sense, we can hardly expect skeptics to believe it. But rational as this exploration aims to be, it is an exam- examination of the rationality of the history just that I've just recounted. 
we have to re-describe and augment the story in order to make sense of it, in order to, to, in order to answer the questions that atonement theory brings up. We have to move to a more fine-grained analysis of some parts of the story, get into the ready details of the gospel. But we should not abandon the framework of the gospel itself or another framework. So here I want to examine two issues, uh, sacrifice and substitution. How do we understand these features of atonement theory within the framework that I've just outlined? How does this framework make perhaps better sense uh, the, of this, these features of atonement theory than the alternatives? So first, sacrifice. How is Jesus uh, work a sacrifice? The gospel story depicts Jesus' death as a sacrifice in a Levitical and Augustinian sense. That is to say, emphasizing not only his atoning death, but his resurrection and his ascent to the Father. In Jesus, the figures of sacrifice come to truth. Ritual is made into the action of the incarnate Son. Sacrifice becomes an historical process. Jesus' sacrifice un unfolds over several moments. We could go back to the beginning of his life and trace it out, but I'll begin with his death. Paul describes Jesus' death as a sin offering by which God condemns sin in the flesh. And the death of Jesus, Torah is used as a pretext to murder God incarnate. Torah is not judged, neither is Jesus, but sinful flesh is, Paul says. And so the death of Jesus, an act of supreme injustice, becomes the climactic piece of evidence in God's lawsuit against sinful flesh. If flesh can go this far, if flesh can kill God, if flesh can turn Torah itself into a grounds for contemning the eternal Torah of God, then the case against flesh is closed. Flesh stands naked and condemned, so the cross is the judgment of this fleshly world. That's where many sacrificial accounts of the atonement end, that is, with the death of Jesus. But if the story of Jesus ends there, there is no atonement. There's no overcoming of curses of Eden and Babel because there is no sacrifice. That's not where sacrifices end in the Bible. Sacrifice doesn't end with the death of the animal. The animal crosses the boundary, passes through the gate into the presence of God only when it's transformed into smoke, only when it dies and then turns into something else. Likewise, there's no human sacrifice unless death is followed by the transfiguration of resurrection. Without the resurrection, Jesus would not have made the Paschal Passage through death to new life. Without the resurrection, human beings would not yet be invited into the inner sanctuary. Even with the resurrection, Jesus' sacrificial progress isn't, isn't complete. In Leviticus, a sacrifice is completed by the ascent of the animal to join the cloud of Yahweh's presence, which is frequently followed by a feast. At the inauguration of the temple, the glory of God descended and then broke out to light the altar and consume the sacrifice. After Jesus is raised, he ascends in a cloud to the Father, to, like the son of, uh, son of Man in Daniel 7, a sacrificial figure who ascends to the Ancient of Days on the clouds of heaven. Jesus receives and pours out the fire of his spirit to turn his disciples into living sacrifice with tongues of fire on their heads. The sacrificial movement is most evident in John's Gospel, where the sacrifice of the cross is not a humiliation, but a glorification. It's not a descent, but it's the beginning of Jesus' ascent and of his return to the Father. You meant it for evil, jo Joseph told his brothers, but God meant it for good. There's a double agency, a double will at work in the cross. We have to look at the event stereoscopically. There is, of course, the evil will of Jesus' enemies who abuse the best of their God's gifts to condemn God himself to death. They think they do God's service when they slaughter Jesus. They expel him from the land of the living like an unclean thing. In their minds, they're the pure priests offering the sacrifice, offering sacrifice by destroying Jesus. Yet the purpose of God triumphs over and through that injustice so that Jesus' death becomes the supreme act of self-sacrifice, the supreme pur purification, the supreme atonement, the destruction of the temple of God and its rising in three days, Jesus' passage across the boundary of Eden and into the presence of his Father. Jesus' murders are not the priests of his sacrifice. Jesus is his own priest, laying down his life of his own volition so that he can take it up again. Jesus offers the sacrifice that Torah figured but couldn't achieve, a human sacrifice of obedience by which humans can travel past the cherubic sword and enter Eden again. And so he opens the way for his disciples to be reunited to the Father. 
This sacrificial theory of the atonement depends entirely on the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus. If the gospels ended with the death of Jesus, Jesus' program would be a failure. The sheep scattered would be a noble but failed to dream for the redemption of humanity. At that point, Torah and its fleshly pharisaical interpreters would be vindicated. A dead Jesus doesn't fulfill the Abrahamic promise. It doesn't reverse the Edenic and Babelic curse. If Jesus had remained dead, his way would be dead, and we would still be under the law, still under the Adamic curse. The sacrificial story cannot end with sacred violence, even ultimate absolute sacred violence. That's not the atonement. Jesus must die and rise to even be a sacrifice in a biblical sense. That's what sacrifices do. They're slaughtered in flesh in order to rise in smoke and spirit. Only a sacrifice that leads to resurrection and exaltation and union with God is a fully Levitical sacrifice and only it can transform the ancient order into the new order of salvation. That's the sort of sacrifice that saves and it's the sort of sacrifice we discover when we deploy the gospel as atonement theory. We turn to substitution. And we can begin at a basic level. Jesus died and rose again as a substitute for his disciples. At the Last Supper, he says, uh, says his body is given for you, and that certainly means given for the people of God throughout all the ages. But in the immediate context, it means specifically and primarily given for the disciples. Jesus' substitution for the disciples is evident on the surface of the narrative. When the Jewish leaders bear down on Jesus, his disciples are cowed by the pressure. Judas betrays Jesus, Peter denies him, the rest of the disciples scatter as Zechariah had prophesied. Jesus is left alone to take the full fury of his enemies. It was common at the time for Romans to suppress Jewish rebellions by executing not only the leader, but also the disciples of disruptive Jews. When Roman soldiers and Jewish guards arrest Jesus in Gethsemane, he doesn't flee or cower. He stands between the soldiers and his friends and demands that the soldiers let the disciples go. He goes to the cross strip not only of his clothing, but of the protective house of his followers. The temple of his corporate body is truly torn down, and quite literally, he lays down his life for his friends. That may seem a small gesture, hardly a cornerstone for an atonement theory, but I suggest that on this, at least, rests the salvation of the world. Jesus is the incarnate creator, come to bring the kingdom of justice by establishing a fulfilled Torah Israel as the social form of salvation. If the disciples die along with Jesus, the redemption of the world is stillborn. Laying down his life for these specific friends, Jesus preserves his renewed Israel. He saves this 12 foundation stones on whom it will be built. As a substitute for the disciples, he preserves the new Eden that was already taking form among them, uh, the post-Babel society of his followers. Jesus dies to preserve the nucleus of the kingdom that he had begun to form among his followers. Or we can take this a step further. Jesus dies as a substitute for Israel, and even, we can say, a penal substitute, who bears the punishment that another deserves. We can peel back several layers here. Jesus dies because of the sins of Israel, as a victim of their violence. Jesus is not a transgressor of Torah, but the Jewish leaders pressure the Romans to execute him as a transgressor. In accusing and condemning Jesus, they nail to the cross with godless hands and put to death the Lord of glory. At another level, the charge against Jesus is that he is a Torah breaker. To the Jews, he's the rebellious son of Deuteronomy 21, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, which is one of the charges that they bring against him in Matthew and Luke. Uh, One who refuses to listen to the traditions of the fathers or to Israel's father, Yahweh. He not only breaks Torah here and there, but evidently renounces Torah entirely. It must have seemed deeply fitting to the Jews that he ends up to the Jewish opponents of Jesus, that he ends up on a cross uh, hanging from a tree, which is the fate of those who renounce Torah's demands and, in fact, the curse in Deuteronomy that is mentioned immediately after the law of the rebellious son. Of course, Jesus is completely innocent of all these charges. He's neither a blasphemer, blasphemer nor a Torah breaker. Rather, the Jews who accuse and condemn him are. They're the blasphemers. Indeed, they're committing blasphemy in the very act of accusing Jesus of blasphemy. They condemn Jesus as the rebellious son when they 
are Yahweh's rebellious but beloved son, Israel. When they urge crucifixion and ask Pilate to put Jesus on a cross to display his cursedness, they're urging a punishment that they should receive. That Jesus dies as a penal substitute is not a piece of abstract theologizing, an inference from or imposition on the gospel narrative. It's a description of the drama. The precision, the precision is exquisite. Penal substitution is a plot summary. But how is this story of penal substitution gospel? How is it anything but a travesty of justice? When Sidney Carton takes Darnay's place of the guillotine, Darnay goes free. Carton's penal substitution liberates him. We can see how that works. But how does Jesus' willing suffering of a penalty that Israel deserves make any difference? We can take a few, uh, follow some uh, steps slowly here. Jesus' disciples betray him and scatter. Yet he dies for them and in the resurrection forgives them and reconciles himself to them, them to himself. A reconciliation signified by the resumption of table fellowship. In the aftermath of Jesus' substitutionary death and resurrection, the Jews who opposed him have two choices. They can acknowledge that the crucified Jesus had been exalted as both Lord and Christ, weep over the one that they pierced, turn from their blasphemy, and join the disciples. Like the penitent executioners of Isaiah 53, they can come to the painful recognition that he was pierced for our transgressions and not his own, crushed for our liabilities. They can entrust themselves to Jesus and so be forgiven as they join the disciples who have been reassembled and reconciled to Jesus. They can discover that the very wounds they inflict on Jesus were for their healing. Or they can stick with the charge of blasphemy, deny the resurrection, try to stamp out the expanding mission of the church, which some do. In either case, Jesus has brought an end or is bringing an end to the old order of things. Those who follow Jesus, the risen one, enter the Christian era. They follow him across the boundary into the presence of God, follow his sacrificial progress back into Eden as they adopt the table practices and purity rules of Jesus, the rebuilt temple. Those who oppose Jesus are heading, as Jesus repeatedly warns, to a disaster that will end with the destruction of the old order, signified by the destruction of the temple. Jesus is a penal substitute for the world because he is a penal substitute for Israel, because he ransoms Israel, those who entrust themselves to him, from the curse and constitutes a new Israel that lives by the Spirit and is sent out on a mission to call the nations to share in that kingdom. He's a penal substitute for the world insofar as he makes a way of forgiveness and reconciliation with God through forming and calling the new, the new Israel. Note that in explaining how penal substitution work, I've, works, I've introduced the resurrection. To make sense of uh, atonement theory, to make sense as atonement theory, penal substitution requires the resurrection. In fact, only with the resurrection is the fact of Jesus' substitution even evident. We know the end of the story, and it's two, th two millennia long sequel. So we miss the uncertainties of the events narrated by the gospel. But we were, if we were living through the events, it would be much more difficult to distinguish the good guys from the bad guys. Jesus seems good, but he does and says unnecessarily provocative things. The charge that he breaks Torah is a plausible one, and for many first century Jews, more than plausible. He certainly causes upheaval in Israel, and one can sympathize with the Pharisees and scribes and Romans who just want things to calm down and want to preserve their old ways of life. We certainly don't recognize that the Pharisees and scribes are blasphemers or enemies of Torah. They seem to be the only ones who uphold God's law. Even when we read the gospel story, we do it without looking ahead. <laughs> we don't know what sort of story it is until the very end. It's a story of noble but doomed attempt to call the world back to God. Is it a story of a martyr to a good cause? Or is it the story of the salvation of humanity by the restoration of Eden? Only with the resurrection are these questions sorted. When Jesus rises, we know that some power, presumably the power he calls Father, is on his side and not on the side of his accusers. By the resurrection, we know that someone thinks Jesus innocent and that this someone has power over the grave so that he can undo the travesty of Jesus' trial. The resurrection is judgment day, a favorable judgment for Jesus, terrifying condemnation for his enemies, and yet, also, the great good news that the Father himself favors the one who was willing to give himself for his enemies 
by giving himself over to his enemies. That suggests that this narrative framework for penal substitution is the only way that penal substitution can avoid Trinitarian tangles or, at worst, heresies. There are crude versions of penal substitution that pit the irascible father against his peacemaking son. Of course, in the Gospel story, both father and son are at war with sin, death, the flesh, and all the persons and institutions enslaved by them. Both father and son love the creation and love humanity and with the spirit conspire to save. But even non-crude versions of penal substitution can run afoul of Trinitarian orthodoxy, especially when penal substitution is abstracted from the concrete events of the trial and death of Jesus. The father never condemns the son, <coughs> never counts him a transgressor. He can't because Jesus is not guilty and the father cannot lie. And because Jesus is his eternal beloved son and the father cannot pretend to hate him for a while. And because the work of the cross is the combined work of the father, son, and spirit. The father never makes common cause with Jesus' accusers. What the father does is to hand the willing Jesus, the willing son, over to be charged falsely by Jews and Romans. He hands the willing son over to our own God-forsakenness. And then he vindicates Jesus and condemns his accusers by raising Jesus in the spirit. The father counts Jesus' death as paying the penalty Israel deserved, but not because he counts Jesus guilty, but because Jesus takes responsibility for Israel's punishment, suffers it. This is the sense in which Jesus bears sin and becomes a curse. And Jesus is not for a moment counted guilty in the divine court. By his predetermined plan, the father parries the accusations, condemnation, and execution to overcome the sin of those who hate Jesus including the very sin they commit in executing him. Taking the gospel as atonement theory holds potential, I think, to heal some of the wounds of Christian soteriology. It bridges Lessing's ugly ditch, or better, it exposes the fact that the ditch has always been an illusion. It integrates Israel's history and Jesus' life with his death and doesn't neglect the climax of the resurrection and ascension. It makes clear that both the accomplishment and application of redemption are social realities. It demonstrates that the Jesus of history is the Christ of the cross and that God was in Christ in these specific events reconciling the world to himself. It heals the apparent breach between representation and concept, between cloud painting and rational explanation, between liturgical celebration and theory. And it may even heal us, teaching us to sing the cross, as Paul said, with both heart and mind. And if you will indulge me for a moment, I will attempt to sing the cross to you. This is a uh, sixth century hymn. Uh, by Fortunatus. The royal banners forward go, the cross shines forth with mystic glow, where he as man who gave man breath, now bows beneath the yoke of death. Fulfilled is all that David told, in true prophetic songs of old, how God the nation's king should be, for God is reigning from the tree. O tree of beauty, tree, tree most fair, ordain those holy limbs to bear. Gone is the shame, each crimson bow proclaims a king of glory now. Blessed tree whose chosen branches bore the wealth that did the world restore, the, pri the price of humankind to pay and spoil the spoiler of his prey. O cross our one reliance hail, still may thy power with us avail. 
more good the righteous souls to win and save the sinner from his sin. To the eternal three in one, let homage meet by all be done. As by the cross thou dost restore, so rule, rule, and guide us evermore. Amen. Thank you. Well, one of the uh, downfalls of this year's Wilkin Colloquium is that Rich Mao, as moderator, uh, could not be here, and so you're left with this uh, substitute, me. I'm sorry. Um, but um, as part of what we do here, we're going to take some questions and engage that wonderful, wonderful presentation uh, that we just heard. Um, but in the, uh, I guess in the spirit of Rich, I guess I'll ask the <laughs> Since he always did, I feel like I need to. Um, so let me ask you that. This is what I was thinking. Um, at the beginning of your paper, uh, you went through uh, the thought of, I think, Anselm, Aquinas, and Calvin. And at one point, you made a passing comment uh, that Aquinas lacked a, I guess you said, a larger framework for the atonement kind of a broader, that pulled it all kind of together. Um, but what, you know, what I've, I've been struck by reading uh, Aquinas that I honestly can say I haven't found in Calvin um, is the centrality of love or charity um, in his explanation of Christ's incarnation, life, death, and resurrection that it kind of works like a hub holding together various, what we may now call, theories of the atonement, like Christus Victor or moral exemplar or satisfaction or even a sense of penal. But I didn't hear anything about love or charity in your, in your talk. Um, there was a lot about Torah, uh, but not what is, seems to be central to Torah, which is love. Um, is, there a re I was, is there a reason for this? Is it being presupposed? Does it come in in some way or, yeah. So Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, just to clarify my comment about Aquinas, uh, it was, my comment was much narrower than you took it. Uh, it wasn't that he lacks a coherent or full uh, understanding of the atonement. I agree with you that he's, Aquinas is able to hold together um, different facets of the atonement in, in one complex picture in a way that uh, uh, many subsequent theologians have not been able to do. So I'm, uh, that was, it was not a criticism of that. It was about the, the way that he deals with the specific episodes of Jesus' life, of his trial, and the circumstances of his death. He does pay attention to the details of the gospel story. In that sense, his atonement discussion is uh, kind of a theological commentary on the text of the gospels. <clears throat> um, so, uh, but uh, what what uh, what he doesn't do is, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, uh, I'm not a Thomist expert at all, so, but it doesn't seem to me that he integrates those features of Jesus' life, death, into, into his theory real clearly. Uh, he treats those in pretty much an isolation. There's, there's an episode, you know, the, what, uh, was it fitting for Jesus to be crucified between two thieves? And he goes on to an explanation of why it was fitting. Was it fitting for him to be crucified, for him to die on a tree? Well, yes, there's lots of, lots of salvation by wood in the Bible. And so, and, you know, it's fitting that uh, uh, the, the race that fell at a tree should be redeemed by a tree and that, that kind of thing. He, res he restores the stolen fruit by attaching himself to the tree of life, that kind of thing. Uh, but that's, those are, those are, isolated reflections on the details of the gospel story. Not, and they, that's, that's what I was saying doesn't amount to a, a coherent. I wasn't, I wasn't talking about his th uh, atonement theory in general. Um, I'm loveless. Um, answer charge like that. Um, 
Well, I, th uh, I guess that um, uh, I would say that in the presentation itself, I think it's implicit. Um, uh, but uh, you know, uh, God doesn't. He, ex he you know, Adam sins. Adam is cursed. God doesn't give up on Adam. Uh, Torah is, as I explained, Torah as, and in in particularly looking at the tabernacle regulations of the Torah, uh, as God's welcome and hospitality. He goes out into the place where Israel is and joins them there to welcome them into his house. Uh, that's an act of love for his bride and for his people. Um, so I think it's, it's implicit there, but you're right that I didn't uh, highlight that as, as a motivating, motivator, and I, sh I should have. Thanks. Other questions? I think that uh, I would want to answer that question as the, the whole point of the presentation was to try to answer those kinds of questions from within the gospel narrative. So how do we understand that within the story of the gospel? Uh, and uh, I think Jesus does suffer the penalty that Israel deserves. Uh, so in that sense, he's, uh, he's the, the guilt, uh, liability to punishment that Israel um, bears, Jesus bears. And that's the sense in which I was suggesting that he has made sin for us and that he is the, uh, the bearer of guilt. Um, what, I, what I, as you rightly said, what I don't want to say is that the father, um, that he, the father pretends that he's guilty for a while. Um, I think that's, that gets into Trinitarian problems. So within the, within the narrative, I think you can make sense of that by saying that Jesus is suffering exactly what Israel deserves. Uh, he's suffering the, the punishments that Torah imposes on Torah breakers when he in fact is not a Torah breaker. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah. At least twice. Okay. Yeah, and I did make a passing reference to it. I think it was in my it was in my paper. I mentioned that uh, sacrifice uh, frequently ends with a meal. Let me let me clarify what I'm what I'm saying and agree with agree with the last point. Part of that was part of that is due to simply uh, um, I carved down a bunch of stuff into a presentation that can fit into the time I had. But uh, part of what I'm disputing, the, or one of the main things I'm disputing, is a an understanding of sacrifice, which I think has been fairly common in the history of Christian uh, theology, that sees it primarily as an act of uh, sacred violence, to use the, the current jargon. Uh, the death of the substitute is what's important about sacrifice. And I'm trying to emphasize, and I, I'm cited Augustine, but uh, other theologians recognize this too. Maybe it's a, a, a later, uh, 
misunderstanding of sacrifice. But that's a moment of, of a process uh, that the animal is moving through death and I think the, the, transfigure, the turning of the animal to smoke is a transfiguration of the animal from flesh into the smoke that is, you know, it resembles the smoke of God's own presence. I think it's a, it's a kind of deification image. Uh, that's the whole, that's the process that the animal's going through, okay? Um, and the, so um, that's, I was, what I was disputing was the, um, the tendency for atonement theory to stop with the death of the, the death of the victim rather than seeing it as part, that death as part of a, a part of a sequence. Uh, and you know, in, in a lot of cases, that is the final moment of sacrifice. Uh, the morning and evening offerings at the temple were uh, ascension offerings called whole burnt offerings, which didn't involve a meal. So the, the foundation of all the other sacrifices during the day were sacrifices that were presented only to God. Uh, it's called God's bread. It's called God's food. God is said to consume the animals. So there's a there's a uh, there's a there's a, an idea of, there's an idea of meal there, but God is the only one who's eating. Um, but I, having all said all that, I agree with you that the, if you if you look at the whole sequence of sacrifice, how sacrifices uh, were laid out in uh, in the temple, how they're fulfilled. Yes, I, I do. I agree with you that um, Jesus offers himself as a sacrifice. He makes the passage into Eden. Uh, through that sacrifice, he brings us in, and Eden is a place of festivity, which is the Eucharist. So that's the way I would, that's how I would put it. And all the stuff I was talking about Eden being a place of, um, of food is, um, you know, in a, in a Christian context, that means Eucharist. The restoration of Eden is uh, found in, our, our restoration to Eden is found in our gathering at the Eucharist. Yeah, I was I was making it a uh, trying to make a distinction. I was making a distinction between um, guilt as liability to punishment, and I I think that Jesus is not Jesus is uh, 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 bears the guilt of Israel in that sense. That's that's what I was saying in the presentation. Not that he's not that he's personally guilty. I don't think the um, again I I question whether it's we want to say that the father holds him guilty when he's not. Um, and so what happens is that he's given over to his enemies. His enemies treat him as guilty. And in the event, he suffers what they deserve, which is bearing their guilt. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, I guess I, I guess I'm I'm not uh, um, maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing the subtlety of what you're trying to say. I, I'm saying that Jesus was uh, bore the guilt that is the liability to punishment. Israel was the one that inflicted that on him. It's the punishment that they themselves deserved. So it and it's a punishment that they declared and enacted. Um, God reverses that, 
uh, demonstrates that he was not guilty by ra raising it from the dead. I don't know if that, I don't know if that answers the question. I, I would have to um, uh, get get more, get more, uh, think more about that and get more specific on it. Thank you. Yeah, I think that the, uh, if I'm understanding what you said in the last point, I, I agree with you that the, the Eucharist is, uh, uh, the, what, what the transfiguration to smoke signifies, I think, in the Old Testament is the um, transfiguration from flesh to spirit. Or you could say, it is an ascent, that smoke does ascend. Um, I'm, uh, I think a, a Calvinist understanding of the Sursum Corda, a Calvinist understanding of the, uh, uh, of the Eucharistic presence. You're caught up into heaven in the spirit to feast on Christ. So I think that's all part of the fulfillment of sacrifice. Um, again, the, it, as far as the, the questions of uh, justice and love, uh, trying, to figure, trying to figure what those, how to, how to assess those questions or how to answer those questions from within the specific narrative of the gospel. So. Uh, why does Jesus have to die? That was, uh, is there a, in what, in what sense is that um, um, an, an act of justice or in what sense is it uh, the demand of justice? Um, well, I think, again, it, within, the, within the narrative of the gospel, the, the Father sends the Son into the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, he goes to enact his Father's kingdom and to claim his, claim his father's world for his father. He goes in to establish justice in the world. And the, uh, those who are uh, in charge of the world, the powers of the world, you could say, uh, kill him. The justice, uh, the, the, uh, that, that's an act of injustice. The father overturns that, overcomes that in the resurrection. I don't think you can... I don't think you can uh, work through that without seeing the conclusion, uh, without working from past just the atoning death of Jesus or the death of Jesus into the resurrection. I think you have to see that the Father um, establishes justice in the resurrection. The resurrection is the justification of Jesus um, that um, reverses the injustice of, the, of his crucifixion. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sure. I'm not. Yeah, uh, I guess maybe maybe I, I need to take a step back and say that uh, I'm I'm skeptical that the way that that question is posed in historic atonement theory is uh, is a 
um, is a thoroughly biblical way of posing the question. Uh, it's posed as, I, mean, I don't know if this is what you're intending, but it's posed as God has demands of justice that require punishment. God has love that uh, seeks forgiveness and reconciliation. You have to reconcile those two. Um, but that, that's not what you're, okay. So maybe you can, uh, maybe you can clarify because I'd. So what I, what I meant is that uh, God gave us a lot of love and a son of all of love offered himself. In other words, God would have forgiven all sins. But other one but without, without actually the redemption, God would not have, would not have shown the love beyond which there is no other to greater love. So sin became the, uh, the occasion that God showed his infinite love. When Jesus suffered, in other words, we have substitution only in the sense, I see, you know, that, uh, that he indeed personally wanted, wanted to feel responsible for all sins of all mankind. Yes, through the sins of Israel, but for all mankind. And so, if someone infinitely loves the Father, if someone infinitely loves us, you know, then that's the worst suffering possible. But he still not out of out of love because he knows that the father doesn't deserve the offenses of the God. So he wants to offer the love that the record that compensates, infinitely compensates for for the sins of all mankind. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be in the line of the Thomas, but also in the line of the Father. And in the line of John, I would love to be on the yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, I think I'll just um leave it at your comment and I think there are other people. Thank you. Um, so it was clear to me here that this power of progression is necessary um, to work with the woman and it was how the rest of life provides me up to the prescription as well as the Torah uh, history. So one of the things is that I have to for a second. Uh, I think there is Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that uh, you, have, you find something similar in Calvin. I, I quoted the, the key passage in Calvin that uh, it's the whole course of his obedience by which he pays, um, pays our debt and redeems us. And so, yeah, you would say similar things are going on in, in Thomas, and he's linking them, you're saying, to specific episodes in the life of Jesus. I guess my, my question then is, going back to the way I formulated at the beginning of the paper is, uh, is it clear that Jesus had to live this particular life in order to, in order to save? Could he has, have accumulated merit in the quiet of Nazareth just by being nice to his mom and not cheating his, never cheating his clients, his, his carpenter clients? And would that have been a meritorious life that would have accumulated the right kind of merit? Uh, or is, so it goes back to the question about the specific shape of the life as it's given in the Gospels. Is that, ne is that necessary? Not just does he need to live a sinless life, but he does he need to live this life that we, that we know that he lived. Is that, is that integral to understanding what he achieved for us? Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I, I, I kind of, I don't think I phrased it as what I really intended. I'm not, I'm not really raising a question about the necessity of that particular life. It's the fact that Jesus lived a particular life. So how, how is that particular life part of the redemption that God achieves for us? First of all, I hope everyone got their copy of the Latin version of the hymn. Or did, did you get the only one? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would have sung it in Latin if I knew the Latin. Um, uh, just a comment on the, on the uh, reference to the poetry itself. Uh, um, uh, I guess uh, one way to describe what I was after is to um, try to I talked about it in terms of looking at atonement theory, uh, the gospel narrative, the gospel history as atonement theory. Um, I think I would be saying, for, in my mind, I'd be saying the same thing if I said that the, uh, a typological reading of scripture is the framework within which we talk about atonement theory. And I was doing that implicitly without talking about typology a lot. But talking about the sacrifices of Torah and how Jesus fulfills that. To my mind, that's a way of uh, integrating the, uh, the, the uh, rational effort to grasp what God achieved in Christ and how it was achieved uh, with the uh, poetic tradition of hymnody and, um, and so on. So that, I, uh, that was, I made some, the, follow, the uh, end comments that's the kind of thing I was getting at. I, I, um, I don't think that we, I don't think that the, and maybe this will go to the answer to the specific question you asked at the end. Um, uh, there, there are ways of answering the questions of atonement theory that, uh, that take them out of that typological and evangelical context to, uh, to wrestle with them at a more philosophical level. Um, I think there's a, there's a pitfall in that because, as you say, the, 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 the gospel narrative includes all of these elements, 
but includes them in particular relationships. And if you, if you take them out of that narrative, that narrative pattern, then the relationships, you may be misconstruing the relationships among them. So that would be part of my answer to the question. Dan, did you use that hymn to teach us Latin when I said it in the I suppose it was part of it. It wasn't very beautiful when you were hammering in the grammar. It's much more beautiful now. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I don't despise that historical evidence at all. I think that has to be uh, that has to be in play, obviously, as we're interpreting uh, scriptures. But uh, the the historical context has to be context for understanding the text. And it does seem to me the text of the Gospels are pretty clear that Jesus is contending with various factions of Jews, and the Jews are conspiring against him to kill him. Uh, that doesn't exclude a Roman element. It doesn't mean that the Jews can get away with everything they might want to do, but it, it's, it's hard to see how that can be avoided um, taking the gospel accounts at face value. Um, am I advocating supersessionism? And that, that would depend on what you mean by that. Uh, if you mean uh, that um, there was a history of Israel that ended and a new history of the church that began. I don't believe that. I believe that we're grafted into the tree of Israel. Um, if you mean that Jews remain in covenant with God, even though they're outside of Christ, um, if that's what supersession means, then I guess I'm a supersessionist because I'm, but uh, I'm, I'm not talking about, I wasn't describing a replacement of uh, and old people with the church. It's a fulfillment. Um, and it's a fulfillment that you know, begins with uh, a renewal movement within Judaism. Uh, that's what the uh, original band of disciples is.
all dealing with the, with the uh, gaps in our own, in our own traditions, aren't we? Um, uh, let me try to reassemble what you just asked me. Um, uh, yeah, e uh, expiation, all the other descriptions that we have in Paul, uh, I think that in, you know, in many cases I would say that those are specifically uh, attached to the death of Jesus. They are, you know, where uh, uh, Jesus, uh, Paul uses, uh, makes reference to Jesus' blood as affecting certain things. So, but I think that's, that, that's, part, of the that's part of the sacrificial procedure. The animal does get killed and uh, that's a necessary part of, the, of what happens as a sacrifice is being offered. It's a necessary part of what Jesus does as a fulfillment of that sacrificial procedure. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's right that Paul is referring uh, specific aspects of the redemption that we have to the death of Jesus. Uh, I don't think Paul is, is in any way, um, I think Jensen is right that I quoted him at the beginning, that uh, without a resurrection, a, uh, a crucified Jesus is not a saving Jesus. That's, that's, not, that's not beneficial. A death without a resurrection is not beneficial. Uh, if Christ is not raised, we are still in our sins. A dead Jesus is not a saving Jesus. So um, in, the, in, the full, uh, in the full scope of Pauline teaching, those aren't isolated from his uh, proclamation of the resurrection. And, uh, they, you know, in the in the sermons in the sermons in Acts, in particular, um, that's the uh, the cross is they're proclaiming the cross, but the resurrection is the climax of their proclamation. Um, they declare the one who has been raised from the dead, who has been made Lord in Christ, who has been installed as King. That's that's the the royal announcement that they're making. Thank you. Uh, please thank Dr. Uh,